Welcome to Well and Worthy Life. I'm so excited today to have Heather Anderson on here with me. Um, Heather and I met through a mutual friend, Kathy, the middle page blog. And um, so, and I started bother, following Heather way, way, way before I actually met her and loved her style, loved everything about her. And then I actually have gotten to meet her in person one time, but we've yeah. talked several times. So Heather, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. Of course, I'm so excited and honored that you asked me to be on it. So I'm just really happy to be here. Well, it really is. It's, I remember, um, I, I guess you, I, I can't remember exactly, um, maybe because you and Kathy have been friends. How long now? I would say uh, probably eight years that yeah, maybe even nine years because we met uh, maybe like six months after we both started blogging. So it's been, I'd say eight or nine years. So a long time ago. <laughs> yes. And is that how y'all met blogging? Yes, exactly. That's how we met. We were at uh, the World uh, Market Trade Center one day and we were with a group of influencers kind of getting a tour of the place and her and I just sort of hit it off because as you know, Kathy is like one of the nicest people in the entire world and she's so kind to everyone. And so her and I just started talking and uh, we just became fast friends. We have so much al uh, alike, I feel like, and also we just really connected. So she's yeah. been one of my really dear friends ever since. No, Kathy, oh, I just I love her. You know, she was actually, I don't know if you know this, she was actually on my, she was my first guest on the podcast when I started. Oh, I know. Yeah. I did know that. I'll have to listen to that episode for sure. Yeah. Um, in fact, because she's due to come back on. We talked about reinventing ourselves and, um, okay. you know, and so it was, it was really a good podcast, but, um, but yeah, so I remember when y'all became friends because she told me about you and then I started mm -hmm. following you and I was like, oh my goodness, she is so beautiful. And, um, Aww, thank you, you are, you're so, <laughs> you look amazing. Well, so are you. <laughs> oh, you're so, I'm like, so, but you are a little bit younger than me. How old are you, Heather? I'm 47. I just turned 47 uh, November 16th. So, oh, yeah, wow. approaching 50. <laughs> you still yeah. got a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, wow, wow. So you started blogging, though. How old were you then when you started blogging? So, yeah, I guess I was, let's just say it was, uh, well, eight or, eight, or eight or nine years ago. So I was probably 38 or 39. Mm -hmm. I would say I'm, I would say I was 39 because it was right after my dad passed away wow. because my dad actually kind of put the idea in my mind, not really of blogging, but of becoming a personal stylist or wardrobe consultant. That's kind of what I did in the beginning before I started blogging. I would, I started my own business as a you know, personal stylist. And so I would meet with women like one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, helping them clean out their closets and then meeting them at a dressing room. And I would pull things from different stores and I would have the dressing room all set up like with the clothing, the, the jewelry, the accessories, the shoes, and handbags. So they just came to that one dressing room and then they could buy, you know, have a, a plethora of items to help, you know, build their wardrobe. And so, and I was just charging by the hour, but that got to be very time consuming because I can only meet in person one-on-one -on -one with someone's, you know, so, so much. And so then I thought, oh, that's when fashion blogging just started becoming a thing. In fact, I think there were only two bloggers that I knew of, one being Sea of Shoes and the other one was Atlantic Pacific. In fact, and I, I want to say Atlantic Pacific. Do you know who that is? I don't. Okay. Are they I want to go out on a limb and say she was the, the absolute first one to have a fashion blog. I mean, I really think really? That's, that's accurate because she was the only one I knew of way back then. And so anyway, I, I did. I said, okay, fine. I'll start my fashion blog because that way I can, you know, put all these outfits up online and then I can reach more women in a more efficient way versus meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so that really sort of took off. And then I stopped with the personal styling business. So I don't do that anymore. Um, and about six months after I started my blog, I hooked up with Reward Style and mm -hmm. started, you know, having um, commissionable links on my blog. So at that point is when I was able to start earning money. But it's not, it's obviously a, you know, a slow climb. You don't just like start earning money 
a ton of money in the beginning. Like a lot of people think like, you know, oh, I want to start a fashion blog. So I've been doing it for six months. When am I going to start earning, you know, a lot of money? And I'm like, okay, it takes time. Like I've been doing this for nine years and it's a slow climb. So it doesn't happen overnight, as you know, with, with anything, nothing truly mm -hmm. amazing happens overnight. It's a lot of hard work and dedication and consistency that goes into it. Yes. Yeah. Consistency. I think yes. that's the key with most things, don't you think? I mean, I think so. it's just like anything. I mean, if somebody wants to lose weight, if somebody wants to do whatever they want to do, mm -hmm. you have to do something a little bit consistently. Um, Absolutely. That is, the key. that is the key. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, okay. So what did you do before you even got into, were you a stay at home mom? Were you a working mm -hmm. mom all these years before all this? What, what'd you Well, do? so I had my babies young. I married my high school sweetheart. We had start, we had been together since we were 16. And so I had my first um, child who was a, a boy, my son, Tyler, mm -hmm. when I was 23. And then I had my daughter, Allie at age 25. And I was a single, I was a stay at home mom until the kids were about, let's see, Allie was six and Tyler was eight and we got divorced. Mm -hmm. And so then at that point I became a single mom and I was in corporate recruiting sales for about two years. And then I met my husband now and he had three kids. And so, and then I had two kids, so we blended families. And so we, now I have five children. So I quit my wow. corporate sales job to stay at home and take care of the five kiddos. And I did that for a couple of years. And then at that point was when I started my personal styling business. But by that point, the kids were in either middle school or high school. So they did, you know, they certainly needed me to be the taxi driver and things like that, but it wasn't like they were little anymore and needed as much care as they did. So I was able to do that. So did you start it because you wanted to make some extra money or you just needed something for yourself or why do you think you started? I would say mostly I needed something for myself and I was sort of finding that I had some time because the kids, like I said, were in school now and I had some, I had more time on my hands and I wanted to, I just felt this urge, you know, to do something like, what am I going to do with my life? What? And so then I, my next question was, well, what do you really love? What do you really love to do? And I mean, since I was, you know, a little, little girl, I mean, age two to three, I remember noticing what my grandmother was wearing and it was always beautiful clothing and jewelry and her makeup and hair were always perfect. And I just admired her so much, you know, um, and I loved fashion since, since I was a little girl and I've always been into, you know, putting outfits together and always cared a lot about what I wore. And I, you know, that might sound shallow to some people. Obviously that's not the main thing I care about. Obviously my, you know, God, my family, you know, my relationships, of course, my friends, like that's obviously number one, but you know, that's my passion. That's what I'm good at. I'm good at putting outfits together. I'm good at helping people dress well because, you know, whether you like it or not, that's the first impression that someone sees of you. Mm -hmm. is what you're, you know, obviously what you look like, but what you're wearing. And so if you dress in a way that makes you feel good and it makes you feel confident, then you can do anything you want. You know, you can do anything you want if you're, if you feel and look confident. So that's kind of the basis of my, of my blog and of my YouTube channel is really just helping and empowering women to look and feel confident. Yeah. And I love that because that's what I talk about a lot. It's about how we feel um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I do think that we do have to, whatever we look like, even if we've got weight that we want to lose or whatever, whatever, we still can dress in a way that is, that fits our bodies, that, yes. that makes us feel comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's, and then that is the first step to being confident and feeling, mm -hmm. um, I feel more confident when I fix my hair and when I put yes. a little bit of makeup on, I mean, I don't wear tons of makeup because I, I, <laughs> I even tell you, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know how to do this. And she tries to show me things all the time, like trying to, I, uh, do my liner on my eyes. My mother for the longest time was like, Deanna, you've got to line your eyes. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> my gosh, you have beautiful eyes. You don't need to line your eyes. <laughs> but anyway, well, um, so getting divorced, that was, uh, I've been divorced a couple of times, but that, 
Yeah. That's, that was, yeah, your children not... were young though, when you got divorced and it was your high school sweetheart. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. I know. It, was, it, it was rough. Was it, it was really just, tough. Yeah. Yeah. It Did was, it um, time to get divorced. Well, so yeah, I mean, I had been thinking about it for years, you know, before I actually did it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he, he was, um, he had some issues with alcohol and things like that. And so that made it very difficult. And, you know, ultimately he ended up cheating on me and I had heard that he had cheated on me many times before that, but I never really caught him and, and had proof because he was also very charming. And so he would, you know, try to lead me to believe that it wasn't true and things like that. And so finally, you know, something happened to where I knew, I mean, I had proof and I knew, and, you know, it wasn't just that, obviously it was the million other things as well that had piled on top of that and that had happened before. And so, you know, I knew, I knew for sure that it, that it was what I needed to do because I had been thinking about it for a very long time. And so uh, I did, I filed for divorce and after 12 years of marriage and it was, it was hard. I mean, I was scared because I was going to be a single mom of two kids and I didn't want to have to go to work because I, I wanted to continue to stay at home and take care of them. Mm -hmm. But God works in mysterious ways. And he was able to, you know, provided a job for me where I was able to work from home. And so I, you know, was still able to be at home with my kids when they, you know, I got to pick them up from school at three 30 or whatever, and be at home with them in the afternoons, help them with their homework, you know, have snacks ready or whatever it is, because that was important to me. And so you know, that was amazing. I was able to work from home, um, you know, but it was, it was hard. I mean, I, you know, you had to sell your house and I had to, you know, move and, you know, get the job and obviously hire the divorce attorney. It was just like so many things, so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And the way I got through it was just like, took it one day at a time and just tackled one thing at a time, one day at a time. Because if I looked at the entire list of like, oh my gosh, I have to do all these things oh my gosh, I would be overwhelmed and depressed and never get out of bed. But if you just say, okay, today I'm going to do this one thing. Like today I'm going to make my resume for my job. And then tomorrow I'm going to, you know, set up an interview. And that, you know what I mean? Just like, you just have to take baby yeah. steps when you go through something like that, because it is extremely, extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and I hard. I totally agree. But you know, take, talking about that, taking baby steps, I think even right now during COVID, there's so much going on. Mm -hmm. And if you try to tackle too much, I mean, I've been talking a lot about, I've got COVID fatigue. I mean, like, oh my God, yeah. it's so hard to get motivated sometimes to do things because of, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think in, in anything you need to take baby steps. But I think especially when you're going through something so stressful like that, because a divorce, man, oh, yeah. It's a, yeah, I would not wish that. I've always said I would not wish that on my worst enemy. Yeah, I've said that exact same thing. <laughs> that is so it is true. A, not a fun thing at all. Um, so. No, it's not. But I think ultimately you have to think about your own happiness, and you and because no one else is going to, you know, take care of you like you're going to take care of yourself. And so it might sound selfish at times, but it's not. You know, you just you have to do what makes you happy you know? Yeah. And if that means cutting someone out of your life, well, so you, that's what you have to do. Right. You know, right. And there can be light on the end of, you know, at the end of the tunnel. Um, so, I mean, you went through that and then, so you were single a couple of years then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm single a couple of years. And then the, actually the boss that hired me to work uh, in corporate sales, recruiting sales mm -hmm. is the one who set up, set me up with my current husband, Brett. And so oh. that was another, I think, another God thing there. And um, yeah, we went out on a date and the rest is history. I mean, we just hit it off right away and we've been married for 12 years now. And oh. I think all the kids are in college. So we're now empty nesters officially. Our last one finally went off to school this year to University of Alabama. So we actually had two go to Alabama and then oh. my daughter goes to Texas Tech and the, our other daughter goes to Boulder. And then Wyatt went to Swanee in Tennessee. So we had five, well, really four of the five were in different colleges in different states. <laughs> so oh my crazy. gosh. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So now um, when y'all got married and he had three, you had two mm -hmm. and that was not mm -hmm. easy, I would think. 
No. Oh my gosh. It was so, so difficult for sure. I mean, because you have all these different dynamics and different, you know, the girls had some issues. They were in the same grade actually. Oh. So that was really difficult because they sort of competed with each other. And then our boys, our older boys were also in the same grade. Um, and one, which in these two pairs were one grade apart. So we had four of them, like all sort of in the same, you know, mix of friends and everything. I mean, the kid, the boys got along really well. The girls get along great now, but for a while they, they kind of struggled a little bit, but yeah, it was definitely difficult. I yeah. see. Um, and then of course it, it created a lot of stress between, uh, Brett and I, because you never really treat your, I mean, we had a therapist tell us this, like, you know, you don't, you, it's impossible to treat your stepkids the same way you treat your own kids and, and you shouldn't. And she, and they said, that's okay. As long as, as long as, the, as long as they know it and, 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 and Brett's kids realize, well, that then they're, since he's their real dad, you know, he isn't going to treat my kids the same way he treats his kids and, and same with me. So as long as, so it kind of makes it fair that way. And of course you try to, you know, we tried to be fair, obviously, but you know, it's just, you want to protect your own kids. And of course you want to protect his too. But I mean, there's just, we, you know, it was very, very difficult and it was very difficult on our marriage for a long time. And, um, but we, you know, we got therapy for it. I think I'm a big, um, believer in therapy. I think that if you are struggling, whether it's in your marriage or just, just alone, just as a person, like I've been getting therapy since I was, you know, in my thirties. And so and my daughter gets it, you know, <laughs> I think it's like the best thing ever. I mean, I couldn't have gotten through life without my therapist. Mm -hmm. So she helps me so much every day. Yeah. Um, oh, I totally, totally, totally agree with you. Um, okay, but so now you are empty nesters, so y'all have not ever been where it's just now it's just the two of you. Mm -hmm. You're like, wait, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, wait, I know. And it's definitely, I feel like, been more challenging since COVID has been here because not only now are we empty nesters, but it's like all of a sudden he's also home every day because he's also working from home and I'm also working from home. And so we kind of started to get on each other's nerves a little bit, you know, and it's like, they're around you more than you ever thought they would be. And I actually heard a statistic that the divorce rate is really high right now during COVID. And our therapist was like, he's so he's never been like fully booked. He is fully booked now and has to turn people away since COVID because people are realizing, I guess, from staying at home and taking, maybe not being so busy that they, that they need therapy, you know, so it's tough. I mean, and plus, and I just, even without COVID being married is hard. I mean, it just is, you know, it's like, yeah, I think it's all, I think it's one of the hardest things. And I read a book one time. It said, if you want to uh, become like Jesus, get married. And I'm like, That's yeah, you have to forgive. Yeah. You have to forgive, you have to forgive you have so to much. Put the other person first. I mean, like, oh, it's just so many things, but mm -hmm. yeah, COVID's been tough, tough on our marriage. Um, it's been, um, we've been back in counseling and it's, our biggest thing is my husband's, he's a very afraid, I shouldn't say, I guess afraid of COVID and I'm not, okay. um, I'm not afraid of it, but he doesn't think that I'm careful enough. Okay. So it's almost like I told, we talked to our, our counselor last week and I said, um, I feel like I should just move down to my, my, um, our beach house. So that we've lived separately. Yeah. And she said, believe it or not, some couples are doing mm -hmm. that right now because yeah. of. I know, because I think everybody has a different view on that. Exactly. You know, luckily, we're both pretty much not, you know, we're careful, but we're not like over the top paranoid. I mean, because neither one of us really have any pre existing con conditions. I mean, we're both still very careful, but mm -hmm. as far as that goes, we're on the same page, but it's more of, um, when the kids were home because so because of COVID, a lot of the, the kid, our kids were in college, but they ended up having to come home <laughs> during that time. So all of a sudden we went from none to like, you know, his daughter's living here and she actually hadn't lived with us much before because she was at her mom's a lot of the time. And as you can imagine, we, you know, her and I butt heads a few times and, you oh. know, of course I want him to stand up for me and, you know, that was difficult because, you know, sometimes he wouldn't in a way I thought he should. And, 
you know, it's just, it's just hard. And mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just really hard. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It is hard. It's hard, but it's worth it in the end. It is worth it. And I think that anything worth having is hard sometimes. I mean, and it's just, uh, yeah. and then, and then it's, you know, have your times where everything's good, you know, and then mm-hmm. you kind of have yeah. your roles and, you know, yeah. But, um, but I, I do believe that if you're with somebody that you can really reason with and talk to. And if you go to counseling therapy, mm-hmm. any of that, I think it helps. I think it helps tremendously. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I do too, for sure. And another thing that's really helped me a lot is Al-Anon. I don't know if you know, do you know what Al-Anon is? Isn't that for, um, people that have, um, I think alcoholics in their family? Well, so actually, so AA is for alcoholics. So AA is Alcoholics Anonymous. And then uh-huh. Al-Anon was created for the family members of the alcoholics. Okay. Okay. And so it, and so because my ex-husband was an alcoholic, and because my, I grew up around a lot of heavy drinking and then my daughter is an alcoholic and she has been in treatment. She went to a treatment center when she was a senior in high school and then she relapsed and then she went back to treatment a year ago. And this last Tuesday, she just had her year anniversary of being sober. Oh, yay. And so oh, I'm, awesome. I'm so happy for her. Uh, so needless to say, last year she had an, a car accident that um, led her to get into treatment. And at that point, I had ran into a few mutual friends uh, and multiple times and I kept hearing from my therapist and from friends like you need to go to Al-Anon you need to go to Al-Anon and by about the third or fourth time that I heard that from different people Mm -hmm. I thought well I'm pretty sure this is God telling me I need to go to an (laughs) Al-Anon meeting and so I I went there's a a group here right by my house that meets in the same building as AA and there's Uh a lot of members and you go and basically what it is is it's a room full of you know like I said, family members of alcoholics, and you just share, there's a lot of, uh, you, you work the 12 steps the same way that they do in AA. Um, there is, because the step one is um, powerless over alcohol. That's in AA, right? Mm-hmm. Well, in Al-Anon, it's um, powerless over, and you fill in the blank, anything. Um, pow- you're, you're basically powerless over all people, because you are. You can't control right. what anyone else does except for yourself. Mm-hmm. And you're powerless over things and mm-hmm. reactions of other people and all these things. So you kind of can fill in the blank as to whatever you need it to be. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, then, and, then, and then everyone in this session shares what's going on with them. And um, so it's like a big group therapy session every time you go and you share and your share can be anywhere between like two and five minutes and everyone shares and you're not allowed to talk back to anyone. So there's no conversation going on. It's just everyone shares one after the other person. There's no interrupting. So, but it's very therapeutic and it brings a lot of peace because then you start to realize there's other people that have gone through what I'm going through, you know, just the trying to control the behavior of the alcoholic and, oh, I, I, you know, why are you drinking? You've already had this many drinks. Like you can't count people's drinks. You're like, you know how insane that is and how it will drive you crazy, you know? And, um, but the, you, and then you start to understand, well, why? Well, because when I was little, you know, I saw people drink too much and become, you know, outrageous. And so that makes you afraid. And so then when you become an adult and you see people drink, it's like, oh, you know, you get worried about, you know, what's going to happen and anything. Anyways, that has helped me tremendously being in Al-Anon but with my daughter, you know, with my yeah. husband, with my other family members. So it's a great, it's a great program. So are y'all still meeting even with COVID? We're meeting on Zoom now. So oh, no, okay. we're not. Yeah. So yeah, so basically you'll just like we're doing here, except for instead of two people, it's sometimes it's 30 people, you know? That's awesome though. I yeah. do think, so I've quit drinking. Um, okay. I, um, and I, I don't. Why? I, okay, so I did a whole episode with um a friend, um, well, she's become my friend, but what happened was, um, it was about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. I've never, when I was younger in college, maybe I drank, I drank too much in college, like some of us have done. Um, but then once I got married to my first husband, I wasn't a big drinker. And, um, then when I married this last husband, the one I'm going to stay with, 
I'll tell him he's, he's the best one I've had so far. Anyway, um, I got to where I couldn't wait till five o'clock. You know, I was just mm -hmm. like, couldn't wait to have that glass of wine. And then as I became my health, you know, health coach and uh, knew the um, effects of alcohol and that I would quit mm -hmm. burning fat once I drank alcohol because it's gonna, your body's gonna burn the alcohol before it will burn anything else. So, oh. um, yeah, so I mean, there I were a lot of that. health reasons, yeah, because okay. it's a toxin. So your mm -hmm. body is going to, if you in, you know, drink a glass of wine or have a, any cocktail or anything, your body's going to use that first before it will dig into your fat or your carbs or anything like that. So anyway, I knew that. And my husband would tell me, you know, Deanna, you drink two or three, because what would happen is I'd drink that one and I'd it kind of take the edge off, but the two, oh yeah, the second one would really take the edge off, right? And then my tongue would get very loose, and I would yeah. say things that I wouldn't say if I hadn't had that, right? So for sure, that um, happens to a lot of people, by the way. <laughs> oh, it does. It happens to a lot of people, and yeah. so I decided that I was going to do a little experiment. Also, I had a son that. One of my sons said, I felt like that drank too much. And so mm -hmm. I was like, mm, I'm going to see, maybe I'm going to quit so I could be a good example for him. So I quit for a while and I, it made, it opened my eyes to all the alcohol that's out there. And it was actually oh my this gosh. Time last year and it was Christmas and we could go to parties and everything that was yeah. kind of weird. So anyway, um, then I started back in January, started drinking a little bit again, but not very much, just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, moderating, I thought. Yeah. And then as long, uh, along my journey, um, one of my clients who I had, she'd gone through uh, my health coaching program and she had not had success. And I talked to her about it and it was because she was drinking and she was drinking mm -hmm. every night. She was having a glass of wine or not, maybe not every night, but every other night anyway. And mm -hmm. I said, you're not going to have results until you really cut way back on your alcohol. And yeah. I said, you know, maybe once a week, but you cannot indulge every night or every other night even. Mm -hmm. So uh, she, she had done it. She didn't lose the weight that she wanted. She came back to me in May and she wanted to sign up again. And I said, you know, it's still the same way, you know, and she <laughs> said, Deanna, she goes, I just did this. Um, I met the, uh, this program called um, the 21 day reset or challenge or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this girl on online sober sis and her name is Jen. And she actually lives in Fort Worth. And oh, cool. so you can look her up. Sober Sis is her um, Instagram name. I love it. She and I've got to be really good friends. And so she has a 21 day challenge. And so I was like, oh my gosh, all of my clients need to do this. Yeah. So sure. it got me very um, curious. She calls it sober minded. She calls it sober curious, all these things. And I love it. Um, and she has this great program because there are so many people, especially right now with COVID, drinking yep. too much, right? And yeah. um, so anyway, it's a great program. So anyway, I, I then I started trying to, I, I went through her 21 day challenge. I didn't drink at all again. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, I feel pretty good. But then I thought, you know, maybe I want to moderate some. And I tell the story on another episode with her, but on my birthday, which was in September, I was 55 hadn't been drinking at all. My mm -hmm. son comes in with um, a bottle of wine. And so I'm thinking for dinner, I'm going to have one glass of wine. This is going to be just one glass of wine. I can moderate. Yeah. So I had that one glass of wine. First of all, it was an $80 bottle of wine, which we never buy expensive <laughs> bottles of wine. $80 was big. That's a lot. So, yeah. so we bought this bottle of wine and, or he had, he brought it in. And so when we were having dinner, he poured it for me and I tasted it and I was like, this isn't even that good, but I kept oh, sipping on it. Okay. And by the time I was done with it, I was like, Hmm, I think I'll have another. And mm -hmm. luckily I stopped myself because I yeah. thought, you know, I didn't even like it. And why would you drink something that you didn't really like? 
And uh, I mean, I was I don't sleep well when I drink. There's just so Me many neither. reasons. So I was just like, yeah. you know what? I'm just not going to drink right now. It doesn't mean I'll never drink. It just means yeah. I'm just, it, I I'm feel just better and it's better for my health if I don't drink. Yeah, so. for sure. Now I'm the same way. I maybe drink one once a week or maybe even once every two weeks and it'll be you know one glass of prosecco maybe two but if i have two like like you said i don't sleep i wake up at 2 a.m or 1 a.m and i'm awake for three hours and then not only that but the next day i crave foods that i would never crave before because my body is i guess well you can answer that better than me why does that happen well, because you're, you, well, we put all the sugar in it from, you know, the alcohol, because especially Prosecco, wine, all that. And so your body, it, it's got to clear out, it's got to clear out all that stuff. But I think anytime, anytime we, we drink or eat anything, I mean, it's like my husband said to me last night, he's like, I crave so much sugar. I, no, he didn't say he craved. He said, I eat so much sugar, I can't stop. And I said, well, the more you eat, the more you're going to crave of it. But same yeah. thing, you know, we crave bad foods when we don't feel so good too. I mean, think about when you're sick, you know, you're, you're yeah. nauseated, you crave like something to try and settle your stomach. And I, I mm -hmm. just think that it is our body's way of saying, you know, Hey, um, yeah. this isn't good. Mm -mm. Yeah. No. For sure. So, um, so, and I knew that about you that you didn't drink very much. Um, mm -hmm. I remember that when we um, had drinks. Yeah. <laughs> one time yeah. we met in person. Um, <laughs> because I think you had like one glass of wine, I think, and you just yeah. really sipped on it. It was barely any. So, yeah. Um, so that's great. Do you, I guess probably too with your background, that's made you much more aware too, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And then with my daughter, too of course i want to honor her when she comes home if she's in the house like i don't want i don't want anyone and i know this maybe isn't fair but i don't really want anyone drinking in our house when she's here for for now at least i mean it's only been a year so maybe you know um maybe later on down the road I, that won't be the case but you know for now i just think it's good to kind of support her and it, you know all, all that we can so because i know it's not easy for her i mean being she's 21 or yeah, 21. So, and yeah. in college, like she's, she's living in a sober dorm actually. And, and she loves it, but you know, she's going to AA meetings at almost every day. She's got a really good group of sober friends around her now that she's made. So I think it takes, you know, just a multiple, multiple things in order to be, if you're a true alcoholic, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it takes multiple things to not drink, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I think so. So I commend her for, and I didn't even know they had sober dorms. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do at Texas Tech. They're one of the best in the country, actually. I don't know that every college has sober dorms, but I think a lot of them are starting to, are starting to now mm -hmm. because it's such a, an epidemic with the, with the alcoholism and that age group, you know? Yeah. Well, so remember I said I was doing it too because I wanted to set a good example for my son and um and he hardly in fact right now he's not drinking at all which is oh good just like me he'll drink that one sip too many and he's like he just doesn't think he yeah doesn't well, no right. one does it totally so, alters yeah. your brain and alters You're your right. thinking and i don't think anybody makes good decisions after they've had a few drinks nor does anybody i mean and especially if you're the sober one in the room you can just be like, it's just like fascinating at how much people's personalities truly change once they start, not after one or sometimes right. even two, but you know what I mean? Like after yeah. several or more, it's like, wow. Yeah, I know. So. It's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you, and I know I could talk to you forever, Heather, ever, Heather, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but so you do look fabulous and you're 47. So what, what do you do to stay in shape and look your best? And how do you feel about as you approach 50? Well, so um, I, I work out, I do hot yoga. Um, I, wor I work out six days a week and I, I don't say that to sound boastful. <laughs> I say I, I work out six days a week because 
I have to work out six days a week because my more for my mind than my body, mm -hmm. because it helps me just have a more peaceful my, uh, you know, state of mind, mm -hmm. working out, exercising. It helps me feel better. It helps me feel less anxious. It helps me feel happier. So I, you know, that those are honestly the, you know, just as important to me as the, as the way I look, obviously I want to feel good. So I do hot yoga, Bikram hot yoga. I swear by that. I've been doing it for probably 15 years and that's a 90 minute um, hot yoga session. It's 105 degrees. And so I, you literally, I, 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 don't even know. I knew you did that. And I'm like, yeah. I don't even know how you do that. <laughs> I've done it. Well, before. it's, you know, once you do it, your body actually really will acclimate in that room within the first five minutes of being in the room. Cause a lot of pe people are like, Oh my gosh, I could never like 105. And I'm like, no, because your body starts to sweat, which cools you down. Right. And you actually feel, I mean, and you won't know until you try, but you feel so good when you're done. Like you have this extreme high, mm -hmm. you, you feel exhilarated, you feel energized, you feel cleansed, you feel, I mean, it's amazing. It's so good. So that's why I love it so much. Um, and anyway, so I do that three days a week and then I do, um, I'll do like a, well, before COVID, I was going to the gym and doing like a lightweight workout class, you know, maybe like a 60 minute class with light weights and cardio mix. But now that COVID's here, I haven't gone back. I have gone back to the hot studio, the hot yoga studio, but I haven't gone back to the gym yet. So now I just do classes on my iPhone, just like a 30 minute weight lift with cardio or, you know, that's pretty much what I do. So I just bought myself some hand weights mm -hmm. and then I'll do different classes on what YouTube, classes? you know, I do uh, this, uh, the Sculpt Society. I like Megan yep. from the Sculpt Society. Yep. She's yep. awesome. Yep. This morning. Yep. Yeah. Okay. She's so good. And then, um, there's this band workout that I do on YouTube. Um, I, I can't remember that it's a guy, a man and a woman, and I do, I'll do that one sometimes. And then there's someone else that's drawn that I can't think of her name right now, but she's very similar to Megan of the Sculpt Society. Okay. And then I just most recently, I'm talking, I've only done it twice, but every Friday I've started going with my friend, Tiffany. She's also an influencer of uh, Street Style Squad. She's one of my good friends too, but is this place called 9020? And it's, it's basically what that means is a 90 minute workout in 20 minutes. And so what they have you do is they have you put on this suit. It's like a black, it kind of looks like a, um, a scuba diving suit but it stops at your knees and stops at your arms. And it's uh, this suit that's on you and it vibrates all your muscles. And so, and as it's vibrating your muscles, you, you lift light weights and you do different exercises in this 20 minute period. And it's like, it's like I said, it's like a 90 minute workout and only 20 minutes because you have this suit on that's, that's you know, vibrating. And um, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but you know, basically, just like working all your muscles because it's vibrating all your muscles. And so it's the weirdest feeling. And so, you know, after you, but the suit, it was written up in like all these workout magazines, like, you know, it's really cool. And so I've been doing that. And he said that you'll start like seeing, you know, results. Um, maybe you get, you're certainly not going to lose weight from it because like you were saying, and this is also what I believe, because I've done a couple of videos on my YouTube channel as well about, um, you know, health and fitness and things like that. But that obviously what you eat is, is I would say 80 to 85% of, you know, responsible for the size you are and the way you look versus working out. I mean, you could just not work out, but if you ate clean and ate healthy, you would not be overweight that you wouldn't. Right. So, cause eating is so much more important than, I'm not saying you don't need to work out. You do obviously, but I'm just saying that, that what you eat is way more important than in an exercise. And so, but he said that this will tone your body, you know, but like I said, I've only done it twice, so I can't say yet, but Tiffany looks great and she swears by it. So I'm like, okay, I'll try it. So I'm going to start doing that every Friday to kind of mix it up. Cause I do get a little bored with the same thing, you know, Yeah. but then to kind of piggyback on what I was saying before about the eating. So what I eat is more of like a Mediter Mediterranean diet. So I eat a lot of salads, eat a lot of fish. I, eat, I, eat nut, I snack on nuts. I snack on, um, you know, gluten-free granola. I snack on 
you know, hard boiled eggs, um, you know, fruit, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables. You know, um, I have a smoothie, a protein smoothie every morning of, um, with vegan protein powder. I put spinach and blueberries and coconut water and things like that um, in that. And I, you know, have that every morning almost. Um, so I eat really healthy, you know, but do I ever cheat for, for sure? So my vice, since I don't really drink is, is sugar. So, I mean, I might be, ad <laughs> I might be addicted to sugar a little bit, but I only have like a little bit. So yeah. maybe I'll have a hand, you know, a couple dark chocolate almonds, or if I go out to eat, you know, I'll get dessert, but I'll only have a couple bites of it or share it with someone, you know, and that's really my only sweet of the day or, you know, a cookie here and there. So I don't like overindulge, but I certainly have to have something sweet every single day. No doubt about that. Well, I you know, so I'm not perfect. That about balance. I mean, right. You know, and I mean, I think that's the most important thing. I think when you try to eliminate anything, mm -hmm. you know, I think just try to do the best that you can. And like you said, you know, stick with whole foods. If we stick with whole foods, less processed foods, but you know, mm -hmm. indulge, you know, some too. I mean, it's, I think. Right. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah, enjoy, I, I mean, I enjoyed a few French fries last night at dinner and, you know, that's okay because I didn't have the whole thing of French fries. I had a couple and it's like, right. you know, if you, yeah, if you balance it out, you know, and I try to stay away from bread and car, you know, pasta, rice. I don't eat that really, but, but will I have a slice of pizza every once in a while? Yes, because I love it so much. Right, right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. I'm the same way. Do you, can you tell a difference between, so you haven't hit 50 yet. And I've talked to a lot of people. A lot of people think they've hit, tell a big difference once they hit 50, but mm -hmm. can you tell a big difference in, you know, your late thirties from when you first started mm -hmm. blogging even until now on the mm -hmm. way you eat or anything like that? Well, for here's what I have to say about that. I was on the birth control pill for a long time. Mm -hmm. probably 15, probably 15 years. And I just got off a year ago and, and, and I, the birth, you know, you always hear, Oh, the birth control pill makes you gain weight. You know, well, I maybe gained two pounds, but to me, that was, it bugged me. Those two, it's stupid. I know, but I, cause I do weigh myself every morning and I probably shouldn't, but that's kind of a way for me to keep, to make sure, like, am I still on track? You know what I mean? So, right. and for most of the time, it's been, it's very easy for me to maintain my weight. And so, and I'd only fluctuate between two pounds, maybe three pounds forever, for as long as I can remember. Wow. But when I got on the pill, you, you better believe I did gain one or two pounds. And then I was like, well, who cares? Like, so I just let that go, whatever, who cares? Cause you know, that was it. And what's two pounds, nothing. That's probably just water weight anyway. But then, so I was struggling, like, should I get off the pill? Should I not get on? Should I not, you know, cause I kept hearing from people like you shouldn't be on the pill this long because also I was taking it consecutively so I wasn't having any periods and that because that's why I got on the pill is to stop my heavy periods and so um, long story short I found a um, bioidentical hormone doctor I read the book by Suzanne Summers uh -huh. about bioidentical hormones mm -hmm. and after I read that book I was sold and I was like I'm getting on bioidentical hormones I'm getting off the pill mm -hmm. this is it so I did so I went and saw I found a really good bioidentical hormone doctor in Dallas her name's Dr. Nikki Walden. If anybody lives in Dallas and needs a good hormone doctor, she's fat. She's fabulous. <clears throat> she was an OBGYN. So she does have her medical license. And so now she practices the bioidentical whole um, health. And so she got, I, you know, I got off the pill mm -hmm. and I dropped those two pounds within two weeks. Like it was crazy. And it, it and then, so and the last, and then I got on, she put me on progesterone because she, she measured my levels. She took my blood. She had me do urine tests. She measured all my levels, which I think is important. You know, don't ever take any hormone unless you've t measured your levels in, with your blood and your urine, because that can be a disaster. So anyway, she measured all my levels and she put me on progesterone and an estrogen patch. And I have, now I have a testosterone pellet because all of my levels were extremely, extremely, extremely low. Mm -hmm. And I was experiencing um, irritability, you know, a little bit of depression, not, not like every day, but just sort of sometimes just a feeling of sadness at the times where I'm like, why am I sad? Like nothing's really wrong. You know what I mean? And so she's like, that's because your hormones were so low. So 
now that I've been on these bioidentical hormones for about five months, I feel so much better. I feel like I can eat more than I used to and still maintain the same weight. Not, not like a ton more, but you know, a little bit more. Like I don't have to feel like I don't have to be as careful as I once was before when I was on the birth control pill. Like I couldn't eat basically hardly anything. And it would, I mean, you know, and so anyways, it's, so for that reason, I think it's better that I've noticed now approaching 50 is better because I'm on these, these hormones. But if I wasn't on the hormones, I bet it, it would be probably getting a little, a little bit harder to maintain a healthy weight. That's great though. Yeah. I'm on bioidentical hormones too. Um, and I think, okay. that, yeah, but you're right. The testing, you have to go to your doctor, you mm -hmm. have to get the testing done. And it's really important to have the right testing done too. Yeah, for I sure. So which like ones do you take? The, the so same I do a progesterone uh, pill at night mm -hmm. and then I have Me a too. cream um, that has uh, estrogen, DHEA, and a little bit of testosterone. And I actually just went to my doctor um, last week, this week, this week I went for my OBGYN checkup and it's my OBGYN that gives them to me and uh, gives me these and it's um, a, at a compounding pharmacy, but my libido is low, low, yeah. low. So my testosterone is, it says that my testosterone on my last test, it was where it should be. But, um, so I keep asking her about the pellets and about the, yeah. um, uh, I've even heard some of my friends have been the testosterone shots and she was like, let's just, uh, try the testosterone cream and mm -hmm. you put it, uh, so they're supposed to be sending that to me. You put it directly on your clitoris and, um, <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah, exactly. Wow. But it's supposed to increase blood flow and sensitivity. And um, okay. so, but, you know, one of the things I talked to the doctor and the, um, and the pharmacist about, they were talking about, we were talking about libido and, you know, as you get older, mm -hmm. your libido can go down. And so, um, but she said, and I think this is so true. It's not just your hormone levels. It's like libido, especially for women is everything, right? We've got to have a little bit of romance. And I keep trying to tell my yeah. husband this, like I, you need to give me a little bit more. He just, yeah. Go like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, um, so but anyway, that's so true uh, though. Yeah. So I'm going to try that. I mean, I've got some friends that have done the the pellets and um, I've, honestly, I think I would like to do that because I think it would be a lot less. I mean, I hate putting creams on and I have a granddaughter and so I have to be very careful about put, you know, if I put a cream on to wash my hands and make sure I'm yeah. not touching anything because I don't want to get anything. On right. Me, right. So, right. Right. Um, so yeah. My doctor said that that the pellets work the best. And she gave me the lowest dosage just to start off with because, you know, then I had some friends who are like, oh my gosh, you know, what if you grow hair on your face or what if you do this? <laughs> and my doctor's like, that's not gonna happen if you measure your levels beforehand and then I know what level to give you. She goes, that only happens when people get too much. And the reason they get too much is because maybe their doctor didn't measure their levels or, you know, who knows why, but. So she's very conservative. So she started me off on a very low dosage, even though my level was already extremely low. Uh, but the main thing I noticed was energy because normally before the testosterone, I would feel tired by, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, because I do get up by six or 6.30, but still, but now, I mean, I'm not tired one bit until bedtime, you know, and I do yeah. go to bed early. I go to bed like nine o'clock every night. <laughs> My kids make fun of me. And you sleep I do. And I, well, it has helped me sleep better. I will say that these, these hormones for sure. Mm -hmm. But actually in the last, I would say week or so, I haven't been, I've been sleeping okay, but like I will wake up in the middle of the night, maybe for like an hour. And I think it's because I'm due for a new testosterone pellet next week. Uh -huh. And so she said, you know, cause you, it lasts three months. And she's like, at the end of your three months, you're going to start noticing some of these other symptoms coming back, like sleeplessness, like maybe some, a little bit of irritability, a little bit of anxiety, like 
uh, I don't know if that has anything to do. I don't know if uh, anxiety has anything to do with testosterone levels, actually, now that I say that. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I think it's I, mainly the energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the sex and every, you know, the libido, which right. for me, that's that's been pretty good, I guess, you know. I, don't, I, I haven't really noticed. <laughs> <laughs> like noticed a ton of the difference with that, but yeah, right. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, okay. Well, like I said, I could talk to you forever, but we do need to wrap up, but I want to ask you one more question. What would your perfect day look like? Oh my gosh. Well, that's a good question. And that's um, interesting because this summer I had a day at my, went out to my brother's house in Fort Worth. He lives in Fort Worth and he has a swimming pool. And so my, uh, I was there with my mom and both of my brothers and their wives and my brothers to my niece and nephew. And then my kids were there, Tyler and Allie. And it was the best day. We, well, we, we, sl we swam together. We played fun games in the swimming pool. You know, we ate together. I think we had, I think we ordered pizza and, you know, had birthday cake and it was just so much fun. Just laugh. We laugh. I always laugh so much and around my brothers. They're just hysterical. They remind me so much of my dad and I miss my dad so much because he died. I lost him to lung cancer about 10 years ago. So anyway, and after that, we took a ride in the golf cart with, with all the kids and drove down to the lake and, you know, and then at the end of that day, I, I really, I wrote that in my journal, I think either that night or the next day. And I wrote, basically was like, if I had only one day left on this earth, this is how I would want to spend my day, you know, with my family at my, with, with the people that I love just a simple day in the summer by the swimming pool, laughing with my brothers and my kids, you know? Oh, I love so that. nothing fancy. That's yeah. That's no, that's so <laughs> perfect. So perfect. Well, okay. So I lost my dad. I think you and I have a lot in common. I didn't realize so my dad died when I was 28 of esophageal oh. cancer and I was daddy's girl and I bet you were too. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And yeah. Oh gosh. How I'm many so brothers sorry. do you have? I have two brothers and I have a sister, but oh. yeah. So, but my sister is not, I'm not really close with her. She's actually my half sister and we have the same, we all have the same dad, but my and then, but my brother, my younger brother and I have the same mom and then my older brother has as a different mom, but he's, you know, I'm still really close with him. And it's like, he's my real brother. Like, you know, I don't say half or whatever, but anyway, so yeah, I was, it was tough though, because yeah. my dad was always my biggest supporter. He was always my biggest fan. He told me I can do anything I want to do as long as I work hard. You know, um, he was at every single game I ever played every single game my kids ever played. He was with me through my divorce. We would go to church together. Like, I mean, it's still, and I'm sure you too, like it still gives, gives me a lump in my throat to think about losing him. It's just, it's awful. It is. I miss him so much every day. But yeah. your mother's still alive. Yes. My mom's still alive and she's amazing and I love her so much and I love getting to spend time with her. She's also very healthy and active. So I took her to Paris. I saw Not that this I was last year. so jealous year of that. My mother died five years ago. So I saw when you took your mom to Paris, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, how yeah. much fun y'all had. Uh, we had so much fun. She is like one of the happiest, most positive people I know. She's always in a good mood and always finds the silver lining. So that's like one of the most amazing things that I love about my mom and admire about my mom. Is she's just always so happy and positive. Oh, oh gosh. That's yeah. Well, you're so yeah. lucky. You're so lucky to still have her. Um, I, I know, I know. Cause you know. you're right. Like you said, a lot of people don't. Well, how did you lose your mom? Cancer. So, oh, you know, gosh. so yeah. So my mother, my dad died at 59 of cancer. And, wow. um, so my mom at 54 was a widow and oh, no. mm -hmm, so she was actually just a, a year younger than I am now. And, uh, so then she met and married my stepfather in two weeks. Crazy. Right. And, um, two weeks after she lost, no, not <gasps> two weeks after Did she she lost now? it was a, uh, not a year after my dad died. It was like maybe 10, 11 months, maybe after my dad died, Okay, like 10 months after my dad died. She met and married my stepfather. 
And um, okay. she was like 55 then. And then she got cancer at 60, but she didn't die then. What she kind? Lived, uh, she had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then she lived for 15 more years um, with, Wow. She, would, she would have good de good years and bad years and then towards the end it was okay. bad but um but yeah uh, so um I'm so sorry yeah it's and what what kind did your dad have he had esophageal cancer so did he smoke he had smoked a pipe when i was a little girl but i don't believe that's what it was because he'd quit and was yeah. very adamant about not being i think it was more reflux he had reflux all the time. And oh. he, had, he always, I remember him always having Rolaids with him. And um, wow. so I'm convinced that's probably what it was. And, you know, this was, I was pregnant with my youngest son and my youngest son's 26. So um, I was pregnant with him when my father passed away. And wow. So 26 years ago, they've, they've come a long way with um, all of these types of cancers. Thank goodness. So Yeah. That's true. That's the truth. Oh my gosh. But, um, well, so did you ever read the China study? No. What is so that? that's a book, uh, a hell, a nutritional book. You'll have to read that for sure. It's basically about this, this study that they did in China about, um, foods that cause cancer. And so what they found was, um, diets high in red meat and dairy tend to get cancer more than anything else. Um, and I think she, obviously sugar is up there as well, but it was mainly the red meat and the dairy that you should really try to stay away from in terms of, you know, the cancer causing things. Right. Um, but anyway, it's a good book. And that's really when, when my dad got cancer and, um, you know, died of that, I got that book and that's really what made me start, you know, eating more organic you know, and obviously the fresh vegetables and fruits and, you know, but mainly the organic, because I feel like a lot of those toxins and preservatives and things like that they put on our foods is so bad, can be so bad for you. Oh, I totally, totally agree. And, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't pay attention to all that until after I didn't even, I think, cause I was so young and in the midst of having my children, when my dad passed away, it wasn't until my mother got cancer. And then she, when she passed away, um, and then I started taking care of, so my stepfather was still alive and they had been married 20 years. So I started taking care of him and he had Lewy body dementia. So oh. I think that's really, I had always been into working out, but not so much into what I ate until mm -hmm. after that. And then between the cancer and the dementia, and I was getting closer to my parents' ages when they got sick. And I was like, I got it. Yeah. So yeah, it, that was sure. kind of my wake up call that I was like, Oh, I need to pay. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Yep. Yep. Well, you do a good job. I'm, I, well, you inspire me every time I see your posts. <laughs> look at you though. <laughs> to eat <I> better. Mean, <laughs> you, you look amazing. And, um, I just thank you so much, Heather, for taking the time out of your day. I know you're so busy with everything you do, but, um, I know yeah, I appreciate you asking me. Well, I know everybody wants to know like what you do so that you do look so good because you are so beautiful. But, but as you and I both know, it starts from the inside. And I think Absolutely. the inside is so much more important than the outside. I mean, the outside is just a package, right? But when you get to know sure. somebody um, and know their heart, I think that that is the, the most important part. But um, yeah, 100%, definitely. Thank you so much. Well, I really okay. Thank it. you so much for having me and um, just have a great rest of your day.